Intrans is looking at various bodies of work that I've uh, undertaken during the last 20 to 25 years. A lot of them have taken three, four, five years to complete. Photos a day and I sat down and we looked at how to bring a selection that would interest people about how possibly I've changed my way of looking at uh, photographing the society around me during that um, 25 years. But at the same time it also gives insight, I hope, to how our society has shifted. I've tried to bring in elements of humor and abstraction in order to draw the viewer into the photographs. Um, often they're drawn to photographs that are initially, on the, uh, possibly on the surface, have a um, color or graphic element and then once they're drawn into the photograph, they can look around and they can see things that possibly they hadn't noticed before and get a, a, a broader sense of how South Africans live. The exhibition is on until the 17th of February and the prints are for sale. So if you get a chance during this COVID time, come in and take a look and I'd appreciate your input. This initial body of work is called Two Dogs and it's, it was photographed in Pringle Bay in the Cape and it was photographed over two Christmas holidays and these dogs would go on holiday at the same time as I would. And <clears throat> this is what they'd do, they'd get up in the morning and they would basically run around, play with each other and then they'd go fishing and they were quite an amazing pair of dogs. They were cousins and they lived to the age of 18 and the one died two months after the other one. So they were really a remarkable pair of dogs and, and quite independent. They would basically do their own thing and then go home for supper. So this series has been shown all over the world in uh, Vietnam, France, South Africa, the USA and yeah. So it's been an interesting, it's a very graphic look at uh, wild, well, at animals because the background is very white and with the sea and then you've got these black dogs performing these amazing um, tricks for me. And that was shot around about 1999 and 2000. The Inner City, I've done two books on the Inner City of Johannesburg. This was the initial one around leading up to the late 90s and 2000 and it was looking how the inner city has transformed was well how it transformed from being a whites only area to being a mixed area and so it was a very interesting time to photograph the city you had people moving in people moving out and it was a they were fantastic juxtapositions of cultures and lifestyles. This project took four years and I, I would just head into town whenever I had time and, and look for little moments that brought out the complexity of South African society and, and how we are still struggling to move between a, an apartheid period and a post-apartheid post period. But this essay was right at the turning point. So it has significance in terms of how societies were mixing. Now again, things have calmed down and um, there, there isn't such dramatic movement. So, I mean, looking at perhaps this photograph You've got a black man moving into a flat, but he's, he's taking a, a painting of a white woman, and it just happens, in this case, to line up with how the bed is. You know, a similar thing, also looking at the, um, the color in interplay, and how this young, young black guy is wearing a, a mask of a queen. And I think that was a pride, I think it was the gay pride march. So that's why they were wearing the queen, queen's outfit. 
This essay was, uh, well, this photograph was taken at a rave concert when ecstasy was running wild. The Edge of Town project uh, also took four to five years and was photographed from 2004 through to 2007 and 8. And it was looking at the literal and figurative edge of town, how people on the edges of communities that were set up during apartheid, um, the townships were, sep were and still are separate from the suburbs. And the, the people that I was photographing in this essay lived on the edge of those townships. So they were trying to eke out a living, but also to find their place within the new South Africa. I was looking for subjects that didn't have a central focus. So all the, uh, all the photographs have a number of focus points. You've got this lady um, sweeping her, her space and then you've got a towel of a, a woman in the foreground and shadows and there's a lot of complexity in how the photograph is put together so that's the reason why it took so long to actually establish this a, a, a congruent set of photographs because I I didn't want one point of focus in this this one you can see it again you've got a young boy in the bottom right hand corner but he's obscured by um, cl yeah, clothes drying and an Omo washing powder sign in the background. So you're not quite clear what is going on. So I wanted to keep that sense of unease, but also that you're drawn in by um, color and shadow and, and elements competing with each other. And I think that reflects, well, that was my idea was to find a subject that actually didn't, didn't gel into one particular statement or one particular focus. And I think my idea was that that reflected how South Africa was at that particular time, and still is for that matter. I think if you look at this photograph, it's, she's, this lady on the right is actually a seamstress and she makes mainly bridal gowns. And this was her shop, so you've got, I was on the outside, there's a stop sign that created this circle where she was looking out. And then behind me are these clouds which are reflected in the glass. This mannequin with a bridal gown and this is inside her space. So it gives you a sense of, of her life, but you've really got to look at it in order to find out um, what is going on and, and what the subject is. Um, this is another uh, larger print from the series The Edge of Town. And I think it's quite a good example of, of how the elements compete with each other. There's, there's an abstractness about the elements. So you've got a, a blue line running straight through the photograph and then you've got this young girl talking on the, on the phone. You've got a shadow in the background. You've got half a face here. You've got this lady talking to that lady, this young kid looking at me. So there's no point of focus that you can say, okay, this is a photograph about someone talking on a phone. It doesn't work like that because you Perhaps you're drawn by the red or the blue or the yellow and then you move into what the inner subject is. Plus you've got reflections of what's happening behind me. Um, but at the same time it does say something about the lives of the people who live in this literal edge of town within the townships. Hard Ground was commissioned by the University of Cape Town. The chemical engineering building wanted a series of 50 photographs that are still displayed today within the building and, and give an idea of how engineering has contributed to the mining industry and, and also the benefication of mining ore. I spent a lot of time 
at uh, various minds, De Beers, Anglo-American, and various others, and I would spend time underground with a very small crew, and we would photograph portraits of people within these environments, and they're incredibly otherworldly when you're two kilometers underground, and the temperature is well over 40 degrees, and the humidity is close to 100%. And these, you know, these for the, for these people, this is an everyday everyday lifestyle, and you know they just get up in the morning, go down the shaft, and that's where they spend their day. There's a sense of being part of something which is um, which other people aren't part of, and I, you can see that they actually feel proud of that work that they're doing. In the portraits they would probably be described as environmental portraits because they give a sense of what the space is around the subject. It can often be really dangerous, <clears throat> but for someone who isn't acclimatized to the underground, the conditions are, are really harsh. The, I mean, I had to normally wait for up to sort of half an hour for my camera to acclimatize in order to take a photograph. They were photographed on Hasselblad using film, so it added another complexity to the logistics of taking the photograph because I had to change the film with wet and dirty hands and try to keep myself reasonably clean. I think what it does is give an idea of the life of a miner and, and how actually for them this is the normal even though the conditions are incredibly abnormal. This project, Painting Over the Present, um, I've allowed to carry on over many years, and it looks at township life and how, even within the most dire and often grim and certainly financially deprived um, communities, there are some people who really shift their environment into a more creative space by using color. So the color acts as, for a viewer of these photographs, the color acts as an initial draw to the, to the brightness. And one can, on, on surface value, look at, the photo, look at the photograph and say, oh, that's a nice colorful photograph of a shack. Um, in this case, someone has used a, a very weathered painting on the, to actually build their shack. But what it does, it draws a viewer in, gives them something to focus on, but while they're looking, they can also look at the detail um, and see, you get a sense of what life must be living in that shack. So the color within this series is both a, an immediate reaction, but it it's a, a tool in which to draw people in, and hence the name Painting Over the Present. Within the essay, I, I looked for, to give us a sense of the personal within it, I, I wanted to create details of people, which in no way in my mind depersonalizes the subject, but acts in tandem with the, photo, with the photographs of the shacks in order to give a sense of these are people that live within this environment and I used color often to bring continuity between these portrait details and the, and the photographs of the shacks. The series Marking Time looks at elements within the landscape that stand out and often are reflected of either the past or a sense of, of how change is affecting the uh, landscape. So a lot of the elements are centrally focused within a square format. So they almost become a monument to a particular structure or set of structures. There's a formality to the way the photographs were taken. So I had to work quite hard in order to not make it one element, central element all the time. In this case, 
you've got two, they used to call them RDP houses, but um, government built houses. So you've got the distance between two of these houses with various elements um, put in. And this, this is a good example of how the environment has shifted as um, low cost housing is being provided by the government. The way I'd photograph, the way I approached this project was I would drive around various parts of the country during uh, road trips and I'd look for elements within the environment that stood out for me and gave a sense of a monument to the past or a monument to the change of the future. In this case, this was an old brick factory where they had left the kiln towers within fairly uh, kind of winter dry landscape and the muted tones give a sense of an overall feel of, of isolation. In this case you've got illegal power lines that was actually in Ladysmith in Natal. This photograph was taken in Stellenbosch and the, it's of illegal power lines and the idea was to produce graphic elements within the image that draws you in. So this is in Britstown in the western, um, in the Northern Cape and it shows how railway bridges and railway stations have, which were so important during possibly the apartheid area, have now been abandoned and but some of the, the beautiful elements still remain and it gives an idea of how life has shifted over time. In this case it wasn't because of the end of apartheid, it was just that trains don't need to stop regularly to fill up with steam water to, to drive the steam engines. Here's another example where a telephone pole had been hit by lightning and so you have just have this fairly spooky outline of the top of a telephone pole left within a farming landscape near Frieda. The series Objects of Reminiscence was photographed in about 13, 14 um, African countries and it looks how the environment has shifted over time and how the natural beauty of Africa is sometimes destroyed in order to to, co to cope with increasing populations and how people live. So you have these often cheap Chinese made plastic flowers that dominate the public spaces within these countries. When foreigners possibly uh, who haven't traveled in Africa they might think that it's a Garden of Eden but actually slowly the environment has been degraded and depleted and plastic <laughs> plastic elements and photographs of of wildlife have become another way of actually um, beautifying and it's also there's something quite colonial in the approach often within public spaces this photograph was taken in L Lilongwe at the Lilongwe Motel and the the painting of uh, fruit and wine and the plastic flowers on the table and the old setup has, has a very colonial feel and even though it's not owned by white people anymore or foreigners so there is a sense that people are reacting to possibly something from the past in order to attract people from from the present this is a the Blue Swan B&B in Lesotho. This is in Madagascar. I sense it's quite bleak and stark. This is in Namibia. Same thing again, you've got plastic flowers, plastic animals, all elements that actually draw you into the idea of Africa but they're no longer real. This was photographed in Zambia 
in, in a small village that was nowhere near the sea, but they decided to put this down as their flooring. It created a beautiful um, graphic display with this um, seascape, which actually has no relation to the area whatsoever. The series, As the Grass Grows, looks at um, a group of youngsters which have been called Born Freeze. They were born after 1994, therefore free, born free of apartheid. But all of these people that are photographed have fallen through the cracks because of the, how the economy in the country has deteriorated due to mismanagement and corruption. And these young people are full of potential, but even though they're called born freeze, they have no power and no ability and no capacity in order to educate themselves beyond their schooling. So I traveled throughout the country looking at youngsters like this and talking to them and getting a sense of how they hold on to hope for their future when actually they, have, they don't have the capacity to go to university or college or to pursue any career that they really want to. So As the Grass Grows is a line from the famous film which won the Oscar in 1966 called Born Free and it was about a lion gaining its freedom but in this case these young people have very little chance of shifting from a, the, the room in their parents house to gaining financial freedom and pursuing their, their career. Around 2013, I returned to the inner city of Johannesburg in order to see how it had shifted from my previous essay, which was called The Inner City. The inner city had changed dramatically within uh, 13 years, and mainly white people had vacated the city, and it was almost 100% black. What was interesting was that foreigners had moved, it, moved into the city, and there was quite a bit of conflict between South Africans and Africans of other nationality. How people coped with that was by creating mini, almost ghettos within certain areas. So in some cases you had the Somalians and the Ethiopians occupying a number of buildings within a certain area. Then you had the Nigerians far away within a number of buildings, the Gambians, the um, Ugandans and everyone kept, uh, has kept life separate and almost carried on the cultures from their home countries within the city. So I approached this essay looking at looking again at color using a sense of um, graphic elements in order to draw one into the the photograph. So in this case you've got a, a sign outside a garage. This was a garage attendant just walking past the sign. A man driving his taxi and in the background a brightly colored bus. So this project again took uh, four years and in order to get photographs that really spoke to that sense of graphic the graphic nature, but also providing an isolation with, uh, within the human elements. The project won the Ernest Cole Award in 2013, which allowed me to, to pay for bodyguards to accompany me day and night throughout the city. So I had three bodyguards with me. Often the night times were a little bit more tense and dangerous. In the time that I was out photographing for this project, I only had two incidents that really felt a little bit unsafe. Here you have two abandoned buildings within the center of town. Um, this man washing after a day's work in an abandoned building, and in this case, makeshift mosque within a storage building, and the, and the man praying on a brightly colored carpet. So it gives a sense of how people adapted the inner city 
in order to live their lives as they as they wish so and people were incredibly inviting to me to allow me to enter their space and to to take a look the population has probably grown 10 times since apartheid times whereas the infrastructure within the inner city hasn't changed very much at all so people are living in a very dense densely populated environment this series here is, is, is different to the rest of the show as it looks at digitally um, manipulated images on, over which I've painted. And what I wanted to do was look at the South African landscape, social and physical, and bring other elements that I couldn't find doing straight photography. So in this case, you have a, a what I did is look at look for old photographs and then bring in elements both digitally in this case you've got possibly sand structures and I put them within an arid environment but allowed a sense of color to add playfulness so there's a sense of play and and harshness this image is called rainbow dating and it confronts the apartheid period where blacks and whites were separated. So you have a group of miners, uh, this photograph probably taken in the 50s, and a group of female teachers, probably also taken at that time or earlier. And it's an idea of a kind of matching of these people, miners matching with teachers. So I've created my own stories that have recreated the past. In this case, I took a, an old book cover, which was called Zululand Romance, but it also confronts the possibly homophobia within certain people within the country that is lingered possibly due to cultural influences. And so you have these two men which symbolize the sense of romance but also you have elements taken from the book which look at the strong cultural uh, values and, and how those are being challenged at the present day. The exhibition is on until the 17th of February and the prints are for sale so if you get a chance during this COVID time come in and take a look and I'd appreciate your input.